Today, I'm going to give a talk about the seven blessings to the seven churches out of Revelations. Get my Bible so I can read. Yes, um, Revelations is one of those books. I don't know, has anyone read Revelations in the last six weeks? Craig? It's a couple of people. Oh, there's a few people. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, and Revelations is one of those books that, ah, oh, um, if you know anyone who's, who thinks they're an owl and calm and you can't say me, um, then you, you, everyone's got their own theory about Revelations, you know, and... Uh, and uh, it's quite fascinating. It's, it, it's a great book. Let me tell you that. But um, today I just want to focus on something, and that is the blessings of the seven churches. So uh, this all comes in Revelations. Matter of fact, the whole of Revelations was sort of written to the seven churches. But um, for those who don't know, Revelations was written by a chap by the, the name of John. And that's John as in John, Jesus' disciple, the one whom he loved, it says. So Jesus had a, a special relationship. Actually, we might move to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, not two, just one. That'll do. Right up, yep, yep. Um, now, John was one of the apostles. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years and he learnt from him. And he was the only apostle to die in old age. All the other apostles were martyred in some way. Uh, but Jesus, actually, just before Jesus died, he told John, look after mum for me. Most people don't realize that's actually in the scriptures, that, that Jesus said to, to John the Baptist, oh, no, not John the Baptist, the other one, John the, the apostle, John the Baptist is dead by then, so there's no use asking him. Um, uh, no, he, 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 Jesus actually said, look after my mum for me, please. And I think that's why John was blessed with the long life, because Jesus had given him a job to do, is look after mum, um, which is a great blessing for a boy, you know, look after your mum. Um, now, the interesting thing is, the whole... What's going on here? Now, Revelations is actually written, it's a letter written to the seven churches. So if you look at the picture, the, the, the small red dots are the seven churches. And if you have a look at it, for those who don't know, that's in what is in modern day Turkey. So uh, if you know the word Turkey, Istanbul, oh, it's not shown on this one. Istanbul, which is sort of where the top of the thing is up there. Um, and there are no churches in that area anymore because it's a Muslim country now. So um, you think, oh, well, it must have been written about the days that were then. Well, it was, yes, it was letters written to those seven churches. And there were seven churches in those places, and if you, you look at this, Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamon, or Pergamos, actually, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In actual fact, if you're traveling, you actually travel up the coast and then down back to the last two, and that's the journey you would have taken to visit all these churches. You would have gone up the coast and then back down. Now, the other red dot that's the island is the island of Patmos. See, it's just off the coast of Ephesus. And it was a prison island. And it's where John was when he wrote this. He'd been, uh, he'd been uh, put into prison and, and exiled onto the island because he was preaching the gospel. And so there he was on, on Patmos and he writes this, um, this well, it, it, well, he's told to write it, actually. If you, if you, if you go to the beginning, it's, it's quite an, an interesting passage. Um, uh, yeah, 
it's um, there's uh, where, does, where does the actual description start? Um, in verse ten of Revelations chapter one, if you get your Bibles, that'd be great. It says in, in chapter uh, verse ten of chapter one, it says, "And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great trumpet, uh, sorry, a great voice as of a trumpet." So he gets this. Um, uh, uh, he's, he's there. Um, it says he was in the spirit. I don't know. He must have been praying in the spirit, or he must have been just resting in the spirit, or something. But he's he's uh, he, he gets this thing, and and this and, and um, this voice comes, and, and and it says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last." Well, I'm pretty sure that's God, because He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. We sing that song, don't we? So so God is speaking. To, to John, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. So you can see it's, it, it's a letter written to them. Now, given that they're gone... You, some people say, oh, well, we shouldn't read Revelations anymore. But no, Revelation actually has this amazing ability. Yes, there's a message to the churches 2,000 years ago, or not quite 2,000 years, probably you know, 1,950 years ago or something like that. But we also know that Revelations is also a history of the church. And the seven churches represent the seven ages of Christianity that bring us up to today. And, uh, and, and it's a historical document. But it's also a general document to the church and the people in the church as well. So not only is it a historical record, but it's also got messages for us as individuals. And I thought today I would look at those individual messages. But before I do, let's do some background. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 19. So if you can all turn to Acts chapter 19, because this gives us a little bit of context as to how the church began in Asia Minor. Now, if you have a look at the left-hand end of the map, you'll see a blue dot, and that blue dot is Corinth. Right? And Corinth was the second largest Roman city. It had a huge population, and it was, it was like an um, oh, administrative capital for the Western, uh, sorry, eastern part of the Roman Empire, right? And so there was this place called Corinth, and uh, and it says here in verse one, and it came to pass that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came unto Ephesus. So what he did, he walked up around the top. Now, you can actually get across at the top there. It doesn't show it on here, but at, at um, is it called Istanbul? No, no, what's it called now? Istanbul. Yeah, it's called Istanbul. It used to be, in those days, it would have been called, I don't know what. No, no, Const Constantine hadn't even turned up there yet. So it was before Constantine. Um, it might have been called um, oh, Byzantia. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You could walk across the top. So he, he walked across the top and he came down through those cities and he reached Ephesus, which at the time was a major seaport and was a major center of uh, Roman Greek culture. For those of you who don't know about Roman culture, the Greeks came first. 
And then the Romans, those nasty Romans, they, they conquered Greece. And they were good. Romans were pretty clever. What that is, instead of trying to wipe out everything, they actually adopted all the Greek stuff into their own um, culture themselves. So they adopted the Greek stuff, Greek, Greek stuff, Greek stuff into their culture. So all the Greek gods just got different names and became Roman gods. You know, so you, you had this thing, and that, that's how they made their lives. And and so Ephesus, which had been sort of part of the Greek Empire was now part of the Roman Empire, and it was a major city. It had the second largest um, amphitheater in the Roman Empire. Right? It, had, it could seat 80,000 people. So it was sort of a bit like um, half of the uh, MCG. Imagine getting the MCG and chopping it in half. And that was this huge amphitheater, and... and Later on in Acts, it talks about the, the, that there was this big riot and they all went up there. And after, but this is the start of the church there. And it says here, um, And having passed, he came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Right, So there were disciples. Um, and he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now these disciples we find out later were disciples of John the Baptist. So they believed in a Messiah, but they had no knowledge of the Messiah. Right? It's quite interesting. So they must have been baptized in Judea and then moved away before Jesus had started preaching. So interesting fact. So, so there were these disciples, and they knew that there was a Messiah coming. They knew the prophecies. They knew that what was happening. But, um, and he said unto them, uh, unto what then were ye baptized? Because they were baptized disciples. And their reply was, unto John's baptism. And Paul, being educated, said, um, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, the word Christ means the anointed one, right? So, um, the anointed Jesus. And, and we know two facts. One, when John, before Jesus turned up, John said, there's one coming who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not even worthy to untie. And then he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All right? And, and so that was what he preached. So, so they knew that. They knew that the Messiah was coming and that he was going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit, right? But they'd been baptized in water unto repentance in anticipation of that, but they did not know it had happened, right? So... Um, it says here, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. That's a bit young, isn't it? 12 years old? No, no, there was 12 of them. There were 12 men. And they became the start of the church of Ephesus. See? And at this stage, there'd been two revivals. Now, the first revival was in Jerusalem with the Jews, right? But then 
there'd been a second revival in Antioch, right? Um, and that was another big revival. The third revival that occurred was Ephesus. That was the third great revival in the New Testament. And, you know, we call ourselves the Revival Fellowship because we just want to do the same thing. And we've seen it, you know, we've seen, we started in Australia as a small group in, in Melbourne, what, 70 years ago? And now we're in every continent of the world and, and you know, we know Europe and, and South America and all these places that it's just spread much the same way as it did in the Bible, by revival, you know. And, uh, and, and this is how the church in Ephesus started, all right? And there was this um, uh, revival and, and, of course, it spread throughout the, 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 the towns in Asia Minor. Now, we know, like all revivals, you know, they, they come and they go. That's, that's the history of revival throughout, the, the, throughout history. Um, and I, I always say it's like, it's like the, the faith of a mustard seed. Mustard is actually a weed. And you don't have to sow it because it just pops up. And up it comes and it grows. And then it produces lots and lots of seeds which you can grind up and make mustard out of. But then the little hard round seeds, the plant will die and you don't know how it happens, but boom, over there another one will come up. And then it'll flourish there. And then, and, and then that one will die and the seeds will come up somewhere else and they'll flourish. You know? That's the gospel. You know, our faith is, a, is like a mustard seed. You know, it, just, it just grows. It comes up and it flourishes. And, and, and you know, we're, having, you know, it, this is, we're just part of that flourishing now. You know, in P&G, they, they had that amazing burst of the gospel. That's how it happens. It's like the mustard seed that just grows and, and spreads. And, and, but then, you know, they, and Asia Minor, you go there now, you won't find a revival meeting anywhere. But we're left with some messages. And let's go now to the next slide. And we read that. We read that there. We, that, that's what we read only a few moments ago. So, um, um, oh, we're going to the next slide. So the first place is Ephesus. Now, let's, we're, we're going to read this. So um, I didn't put the references in your Bible. But go to Revelations chapter 2. So if you're following on and writing notes, go to Revelations chapter 2. Um, Oh, how's the time going? I can keep, I can rattle on for a bit longer, can't I? Um, so, so this is how they all go. Unto the, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hath laboured, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now that word left is divorced it's a strange word um, so we have this place Ephesus now I for those who don't know Ephesus was the center of the worship of a goddess called um, Athena or what was her other name Diana yeah, in, to the Romans, she was Diana, and, but she was also called Athena. And her temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You know how you had the seven wonders of the ancient world? The temple of Diana in Ephesus was the most amazing building. It was this huge temple and the temple worship there. 
And because of that, the church was really uh, afflicted, right? Uh, in, in actual fact, we find Alexander, the, the, the silversmith, he's the one that, that stirred up trouble for Paul and he got the whole city to rush into the, that huge Colosseum, you know, the big amphitheater. And they, that, no, it wasn't the Colosseum, so it was the amphitheater. And they all rushed in there and they started yelling out at the tops of their voice, you know, you know great uh, 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 Artemis of the Ephesians or something. She's, they're yelling it out and they want blood. And, and the church was afflicted because, as we know in the church, we don't believe in gods that we worship. You know, we don't carve bits of wood and stick them on a post and worship them. You know, we don't get bits of gold and, you know, the Bible says quite clearly, how is it that you can get a piece of wood and carve it and worship it and you get the same piece of wood, the other half of it, and put it in the fire to burn to keep you warm? You know, what? How can it be a God if you can just burn it in the fire? Same with a piece of gold, you know, the same piece of gold you can turn into a golden image of some god, but yet that same piece of gold, if it had been melted down into a spittoon, you'd spit into it, you know. How can a piece of gold be a god? It can't be a god. So what Paul was saying is we don't worship gods of wood and gold. We worship the god who created the universe, who lives in us by the Spirit. And Alexander didn't like that because you know what? He made a lot of money selling the little gold trinkets or the little silver trinkets. Like most religious people, you know, they, they, they're in it for the money. Are you in it for the money, Pastor Brad? <laughs> No, we're not in it for the money. You know, um, it, 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 we're in it for the gospel. And as a result, this scripture was so true, you know, that, that they were afflicted. But unfortunately, Ephesus also, if you have a look at that, oh, actually, I had, there was another picture. One of the great libraries of the ancient world was at Ephesus. And, and this is terrible. But over the road from the library was the brothel, right? The, the, where all the, the, what do you call them, the temple ladies. Where you, and there was actually a tunnel underneath the library that went under the road and up into the brothel. So you could say to your wife, I'm going to church now. And then you could, oh, sorry, I'm going to the library to study and then they'd go across the road. And it was just a corrupt place. And that's what happened to the church. It became corrupted. So what did he say? He said, um, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I w and remo will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. All right. um, and it continues on. Uh, but this thou hast, what thou hatest, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, now it's interesting, Nicolaitans, uh, Nico means conqueror, and Laetans comes from the word laity, and it's a belief that the, that the priesthood is above the church, which is the Roman Catholic belief system, that the, you know, that the priests are above the people. So if you go to a church where there are these priests who believe they're better than everyone else, then they are Nicolaitans. They are conquerors of the people. You know, they're above the people. And we don't, and, and, and anyway, apparently the Ephesians weren't doing that, so that's good. Um, and it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And remember, I said the talk today was about the seven blessings. And this is one of the blessings. So 
Um, as I said, each of these churches is like a message for various attitudes in the church. Right? Now, yeah, I don't know if there's anyone in this room, I don't know if there's anyone here in this room that's, um, whose mind is dwelling or, or drifting away from the things of God. Maybe it is happening, I don't know. This is an encouragement for you. Remember your first love. Now, I remember when I first, it's 40 years ago, was it 40 years ago? I can't remember. 35 years ago, when I first received the Holy Spirit. And I just remember, for me the sensation was, because I was a warrior, and when I received the Holy Spirit, it just felt like someone had taken this burden off my shoulder. I didn't have to worry about anything ever again because I knew God was real, you know? And, that, and, and, you know, there's times in my walk and I've, I've been slack. I know, who's never been slack? Oh, good. Whew. So I'm, I can say this. Um, I know I've been slack at times and the encouragement is remember your first love. Remember your first love. Come back. And if you do, you will be returned to the experience of Adam at the beginning before he sinned. See, our promise, if you overcome, then you will have the like relationship to Adam before the fall with God. Who wants that? We do, don't we? And imagine how good that's going to be. Imagine how good it's going to be. It's going to be marvelous. But remember this, there is one requirement. You have to overcome. And overcoming involves two things you've got to overcome. You've got to overcome, well, the easiest one to overcome is the outside afflictions that you'll get. The condemnation, the criticism, the ostracizing, or the, the boss who, here we heard in the testimony, the boss who picks on you because they're offended because you're so happy. I remember doing that. I, I had a job once. And it was a terrible job. And I used to turn up to work on Monday mornings after having been to a, a Sunday night meeting. We used to have Sunday night meetings. And, and, and I'd have the choruses in my head as I was going to work. And I'd, I'd walk into the, into, the, into the staff room, you know, singing in my head and smiling. And, and one morning this lady just turned to me. And I had witnessed to her, this is the, I told her about God, and she turned to me one morning and she said, how dare you turn up on a Monday morning happy? The rest of us aren't happy and we don't want you reminding us of that fact. And I went, I'm sorry, I won't be happy anymore. Like, what do you do? It was crazy, it was crazy. So you'll get the outside people, who will try and bring you down, right? But that's easy to deal with. What is the biggest overcoming you've got to do? Yourself, your own attitudes. What's between? I always say the biggest battle we have is halfway between your left ear and your right ear. That's where your biggest battle is always going to be. Amen? It's true. And, it's about, and, and all these scriptures, now I'm going to run out of time if I keep rattling on too much, but... I'm just going to read the seven blessings now. Let's read the seven blessings. So, um, so that was the first one. Now, next slide. Oh, here we are, Smyrna. Um, now, I've got to find it. Where, where's, oh, I didn't write the scriptures. I didn't write the references. Um, I've got to find it myself. Oh, here it is. In verse 11 of chapter 2. And he that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Wow, that's a bit bizarre, the first death. Well, if you want to know about it, you're going to have to go all the way to Revelation 19 to find out what that means. But essentially, there are two deaths that you can have. The death of your body and the death of your soul. 
And I can tell you, the first death is fine. We had a sister a couple of weeks ago who went through the first death happily. Praise the Lord, you know. If you can walk in the Spirit and then this tabernacle of your soul just gets so tatty it falls apart, praise the Lord. Because if you die an overcomer, the second death cannot hurt you, which is the death of your soul. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Isn't that a beautiful blessing? But again, what do you have to be? You have to be a or an overcomer. Yeah, that's what it is. It is. Right, let's go to the next church. Let's go to see what the next one is. And, and these pictures, they're all pictures of these ancient cities. I just thought I'd throw them in there so you realize these are real places. They're not actually imaginary Bible places. You can actually go there today and you can walk on the amphitheater that Paul stood on. I haven't thought, oh, gee, wouldn't it be great to go to Ephesus and to stand in the middle of the amphitheater and go, you foolish Ephesians, you know, why do you worship these golden images? You know, our God. Wouldn't it be fun to go there and do that? You can go there, and this is, this is actually the smaller, it's not as big an amphitheater, but this is the one in Pergamos. Um, oh, Pergamos is interesting, because Pergamos has an interesting story. I shouldn't, oh, I shouldn't go, should I? Um, uh, yeah, look, verse 13, if you go there, it's, it's, Pergamos has got a really interesting story. It says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Wow, what does that mean? Do you know on the mountain at the top there, behind that city, was an evil, um, oh, um, what do you call it? Um, like a, 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 um, what do they call it? A, a ritual place to the god of uh, Jupiter, I think it was. And they used to sacrifice children on this place. And what it was was this huge seat, right, that had a, um, originally it had, had a, a statue of Jupiter on it. It was this huge seat that was there, right? And, and, and they used to worship, they used to sacrifice children to this God up there, you know? And, it, it, and, and that's why it was described as Satan's seat. And you know an interesting fact about that? In the late 1800s, German uh, archaeologists went there and they took it. They, 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 they demolished it stone by stone and put it into Berlin. And you can still go to Berlin and there is Satan's seat in the middle of Berlin. Now we know, did anything bad happen in Berlin last century you know you know probably the most evil man that's ever lived you know reigned from that place you know anyway sorry i'm getting dramatic here i should stop getting dramatic i'll settle down um but where's this one now what are we up to pergamos um i think this is the one yeah uh satan seed is blah 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 uh, and get, no, right. In verse 17, it says, and, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written that no man uh, uh, knoweth, saving he that receiveth, receiveth it. And, and this is... Um, you know, we know in the Bible, the manna was the, 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 the food of God sent down from heaven, you know, and would nourish us forever. And, and this is the promise that's given to us, that we will be given food. And what was the secret about the food, the manna? What was its secret thing? It was always there, and there was always enough, and it never ran out. That symbolizes the blessing of God. Yeah? And, and we, 
if we overcome, we will have that manna from heaven that will never run out we'll, and we'll be fed for all eternity on the good things of God. Amen? Amen. Don't you want that? And I don't know the significance, I should get the significance of the white stone, but we're going to have a new name written on that stone. And, and it's, our, it's our godly stone. I don't know if we're going to wear it around our neck or just have it in our pocket. But, you know, you're going to have a new name, which is a name which says, this is a name that God is going to give you for being a faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Won't that be good? But again, what do we have to do to get that? We have to overcome. We have to overcome. Um, let's go to the next church. Actually, I better finish before too much longer. Where are we going here? Where are we going? Um, so we've done, per we're up to Thyatira. Or Thy yeah, Thyra Thyatira. And uh, it says in verse 26 of chapter 2, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works. Now this is interesting because now there's another condition being added to it. Not only do you have to overcome, but now you have to keep my works unto the end. So if you do that, it says here, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as vessels of the potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, now, this is a blessing that like, like, people don't realize that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming to collect his faithful overcomers and then we're going to become his government on earth. Did you know that? And we're going to reign over a perfect government. It says, and it says that no one will die before their age, there'll be no violence, there'll be no crime, and everyone will have everything they need. Amen? How good will that be? Being a, a people, it says here, we will rule over the nations. And we'll have a rod of iron, so anyone who does the wrong thing, you can break them like a potter would break a broken pot. Because that analogy... In a, in a uh, 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 what, what was the place you call a pottery, anyway, where they make pots, a pottery house. Um, what they had was when they took the pots out of the kiln, all the good ones were put in a heap, right? And they were used. But the crack pots... All the crack pots were put over here. And then they used to get this iron rod and then they would smash them to pieces. And then they used to use them to fill up the walls of the city and stuff like that. Or, you know. and, and so who wants to be a crack pot? No, we want to be good pots. I want to be one of the good pots. I don't want to get beaten. But it's an analogy to, you know, um, and, and there are gospel crackpots around the place. And we don't want to be gospel. We want to be, we want to be pure, good pots to do the right thing. You know? and, and, and that's what it's about. You know? that, that, it's, 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 um, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, next one, Sardis. Another town there. Uh, now, is this one on this? I think that's in the next page. This is in chapter 3. So you're going to have to go over the page. Chapter 3. Now, if you want to, you can research each of these churches, and there's a whole description. We don't have time today. We just couldn't do it. We do not have the time to go through this. But you'll see there's characteristics of each of this church, and they are applicable to bad attitudes in the church. And there's how things you can do to fix up your bad attitude. And it's all, it's all there. You know. um, um, and it says here... Um, Ooh, it, it all starts, oh, no, that's Philadelphia, here we are. Uh, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father 
and before his angels. And that's the truth of what Jesus' role in our life is. You know, through the Spirit, and this is interesting because the, the word's um, uh, overcomer, right? Um, parakletos, a Greek word, and it would be used for the lawyer who stood before you in a, in a court of law. So if you had to go to court, your lawyer would be called your paraclete. And he spoke for you. And in the ju day of judgment, when all men stand to be judged, what's going to happen is you're, Jesus is going to say, oh, it's okay, he's one of mine. That's exactly what's going to happen. As it says here, um, uh, um, Jesus will confess your name. He'll say, okay, uh, you know, you know, Arthur Marshman, you know, the voice will come, stand before the throne. And I'll be there with my knees shaking because I know the bad things I've done in my life. You know, I'll be going, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be good enough to make this. And Jesus is just going to go, it's okay. He's one of mine. Isn't that a good thought? Isn't that a lovely feeling? Do you want to be like that? <laughs> Me too. You know, I know. See, see, there are two sorts of people. Sinners and repentant sinners. There ain't no good people. I'm telling you that. There are sinners and there's repentant sinners. I want to be on the repentant sinners bench. Seriously. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. And I want to be on the side where I've got the little tag on here that said, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed. You know, or the you know, stamp on my head, sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm a forehead. Boom. He's all right. Um, let's keep going. What's the next church? Philadelphia. Godly love. Um, oh, I love this one. To him, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Amen? Amen. I like this one. I, I love that scripture says, we are lively stones built up into a holy temple. You know, every one of you is like the brick on the wall. See all the bricks in the wall? If you take one of them out, the wall's not complete. You've all got a place in God's kingdom. Amen? Amen? And, God's, and, you, and you're going to be one of the pillars of the temple. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a temple in Jerusalem, and, and you're going to be one of the pillars of the temple of God in heaven. Amen? Isn't that a great promise? I love that one. Let's move on. Next one. What's the next one? Ah, now this is the last church. Actually, this is our church. I should read the whole lot, but no, time's getting on. Um, this is the church that thinks it's rich and actually is poor. This is the church that thinks it can see but is actually blind. This is the church that's naked but they think they're clothed in righteousness. That is our age, you know. That is our age. Yeah, they might be rich in money, but they're poor in spirit. They might have the flashiest clothes in all history, but spiritually they're naked, you know. Their eyes are never full of looking at things. It's all about what you can see and what you can... Isn't it about image? Isn't it not all in a society of image? But sadly, they cannot see the truth. That's the church of the Laodiceans. That is the church of the Laodiceans. And that's the one we live in. How's it put it? They're lukewarm. Lukewarm. You know? I counsel thee to, tr to buy of me gold tried in fire. Now, this is the interesting thing because this ties it in with overcoming. 
Because what does it say in, I think it's Peter or Timothy? In Thessalonians, it says, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold, even though it is tried by fire. Do you know why overcoming is so precious? Because it is what purifies you. Who's never had a problem in the Lord ever? God loves you. Because you cannot make it into the kingdom of God unless you're an overcomer. And you cannot become an overcomer until you've had a tribulation. Count it all joy when you fall into temptation or tribulation. Because God is faithful, because that's his measure of faith. I always say this, character is forged in the fires of adversity. Amen? It is true. It is true. And that's where you become purified, in the fires of temptation, in the fires of accusation, in the fires of false, you know, false accusation, in the fires of all those things that people will do. Right? They'll accuse you, they'll, they'll uh, criticize you, they'll put you down, they'll do all those sorts of things. But it doesn't matter. If you're faithful, God is faithful. Amen? And that's the point. And, and I, we'll finish with the last scripture. Let's, let's go. Um, oh, did I do layers? This, did we do layers of sin? What does it say? What, what was the thing though? Oh, you get to sit with Jesus. Isn't that going to be fun? Sitting right next to him. Amen? I want that. I want to sit with Jesus. Who else wants to sit with Jesus? I do. I want to sit with Jesus. Next one. Oh, let's read this because I'll finish here. And, and this is probably plenty long enough, isn't it? When do we finish? Oh, I've gone too long. Sorry. I've missed out. I forgot. I'm supposed to be finished ages ago. Okay, sorry, I'll finish here. Um, oh, I'll finish there. It's going to be great, amen? 